So I'm just going to introduce Mark America now. So Mark America has exhibited his interdisciplinary artwork in many venues, including the Whitney Biennale, the Walker Arts Centre, the Denver Art Museum, the Institute of Contemporary Arts in London, the Istanbul Biennale, the Biennale de Montreal, and the American Museum of the Moving Image. His comprehensive mid-career retrospective was recently exhibited at the National Museum of Contemporary Art in Athens. A cult novelist, media theorist, web publisher, and live audiovisual artist who has performed internationally, America is the author of many books of fiction and non-fiction, including his recently published book, Remix the Book, by University of Minnesota Press, and a large collection of artist writings entitled Metadata and Digital Poetics, also by the MIT Press. Clinch. Ontology. Glitch, ontology, glitch, ontology, glitch, ontology. The verb I, voco, visual apparatus, Corrupted, core corrupted. At its core, rupturing the image faces its digital other and wonders, can I relate? Can I relate? Can I relate to the other images intersubjectively remixing their stories on the go in auto affect mode? The images say I too am digital, the images seem to ask, but how can I relate? How can I remediate? Is there a virtual light at the end of the tunnel? emitted by whom, captured by what, processed through what remixological apparatus, what apparatus already finds itself unconsciously pre-programming our aesthetic vision of a literature still yet to come. To come as in to write. To come to writing. This glitch mechanism has been making a ghost appearance for centuries now. Think of it as the specter of e-lit, of networked literary presence, of intersubjective agency captured in the transmission of mirroring neurons, mirroring neurons. You can read about it in the freely downloadable user's manual. I'm thinking of that section where it is written, quote, engineering the difference via optimized ontological machining 
This fuse deconstruction modeling program enables vital critical making like never before. You too can experience the pleasure of the text by simply allowing yourself to machine the machine. Machine the machine. Some assemblage required. Some textual frottage required. Rubbing these algorithmic texts together as if to generate some kind of heat and conjure up yet more digital images. Is this what it means to charge language to the utmost possible degree? These images keep making their apparition of an appearance and ask us, what does it mean to program desire in a robotic world that strains to create? These too are the images of the world we travel through, the world of cognitive mapping and quick time virtual light stitched together as a glitch collage made out of the source material everywhere. And it was written, glitch is the soul in the machine. Everybody, please join in. Glitch is the soul in the machine. Together, Glitch is the soul in the machine. Yes, Glitch is the soul in the machine. Glitch is the soul in the machine, even as that same machine machines the glitch in its own image. And as anyone with a history of dead bodies lying in their wake will tell you, hacking that process is always already an inside job. We can say every story is a travel story, a spatial practice. These spatial practices, these trance rituals transfigured in time are wired into our DNA. These interstitial rubbings these moments of textual frottage, why is it so stimulating to me? Why can't I keep my eyes off it? Writing is the flesh, I just can't keep my eyes off of. Writing is the strange attractor I just can't stop rubbing myself against. It's driving me wild, again, always, and I really can't stop myself. I just want to touch it, writing, to lick its outer edge, writing, and slowly, if it will let me go in deep. 
go in deep and take hold of it the way I take hold of any apparatus and just make it come back to writing to write to turn it on while mutually remediating a profusion of uncensored glitch markings that leave a raw data trace the hand coded smear of a glitchy markup language that always tells the tale the tale of metadata the tale of by the tale of meditating circulating in this intersubjectively worked space flows medium Thank you, Mark. The video is now ended. So if you want to come in. Yep. So, uh, yeah. And uh, you might consider that a creative outcome, one that's generated from a practice-based research methodology sponsored primarily by the UK's abandoned normal devices uh, in conjunction with Corner House, in fact, Liverpool, and the former Folly in Lancaster, but also the Atlas Institute and the Center for Humanities and Art, both located at the University of Colorado. And it's an excerpt from my project, Museum of Glitch Aesthetics, which is at glitchmuseum.com, and, and I think we have it on the screen if we want to just click the homepage. Thanks. So the last time that I actually performed my Glitch Ontology Manifesto as an opening was before a live audience. It was last November at the Conservatoire in the heart of Paris as part of my recent stint as the uh, Labex International Research Chair at the University of Paris 8, where my colleagues invited me to deliver what they termed, and I'll put it in quotes, a hybrid conference something that really has no definition or translation in English per se, but that because we don't know what it is means we can discover it on our own as part of the uh, heretic process. By heretic, I'm actually referring to Gregory Ulmer's book, Heretics, where he starts off talking about grammatology and says that theory is assimilated into the humanities in two principal ways, by critical interpretation and by artistic experimentation. And so uh, this to me is what makes that kind of post-humanity, to borrow the terminology for this event, uh, practice-based the artist as performer, uh, new media theorist, applied remixologist, maybe provocateur of radical pedagogy can creatively hack the institutional context they find themselves in, should they be, say, as in my case, a professor of art and art history, but who also, really out of necessity, is still the same underground fiction writer they've always been. See, for example, my 1993 novel, uh, Coffin Chronicles, or the 1995 uh, novelization or re uh, Songs of Nadarore. Uh, that novel is called Sexual Blood. So this hybrid conference that uh, I was asked to give in, uh, in Paris, it ends up as something like an embodied praxis, one that performs its theoretical agenda by sampling from 
whatever source material feels attractive at the time of composition and can be intuitively manipulated for aesthetic purpose, or if not purpose, then at least playfulness, or if not aesthetic playfulness, maybe what I mean is aesthetic fitness, as in the survival of the fittest, because it is an embodied praxis after all. So when I ended uh, the reading of the Glitch Ontology Manifesto in Paris a few months ago, I didn't really segue into the next bit by saying, you know, that's a creative outcome and it's one that's generated from a practice-based research methodology, you know, sponsored by this unusual alignment of UK arts organizations powered by, as Anne likes to uh, refer to themselves, the anarchic imagination, as well as these various academic units at the University of Colorado. Uh, instead, after the video stopped playing and I had finished delivering the manifesto on, actually on the same stage that Berlioz debuted his Symphonie Fantastique in 1830, after everything had come to a, a momentary standstill, uh, there was a long pause, we'll call it a pregnant pause. And I looked out at the audience and I asked, what else am I going to be able to remix? And the reason I asked that question is because the, again, this underground novelist in me, the one who transcribes his unconscious readiness potential into these morphing theoretical fictions across all manner of transmedia interfaces and digitally contextualized compositional environments. Uh, it's, it's always looking for, I'm always looking for, we might even say hunting for more source material to sample from so as to continually feed my creative intellect and transmute whatever energy there may be in the source material into a kind of pseudo-autobiographical narrative, one that supposedly runs parallel to the life and times of this, this figure whose cloud of metadata somehow translates into the, the work of a persona referred to in the Museum of Glitch Aesthetics as the Artist 2.0. So the Glitch Ontology Manifesto that gets uh, sampled into the hybrid conference is actually an outgrowth of the Museum of Glitch Aesthetics, or what we have ended up calling MOGA for short. And I say we because MOGA is a collaborative art project that challenges what I think to be con conventional fine arts and humanities practices. In fact, to my utter surprise, although I think I have finally gotten used to it, we is a dangerous word in a department of art and art history, especially one that still finds itself not only rooted in, but in a way stuck in the muck of 19th century studio art practices and the scholarly art histories that run parallel to them. So we is not the individual studio artist as genius, but more like the collaboratively networked realm of the potential seniors, to use Eno's term. We who do it ourselves and see where imaginary practices uh, in the process of being discovered can take us. So I mentioned that in many ways, this idea of the practice-based researcher is a kind of extension of the underground fiction writer that I've always been. And that's another way of saying being a practice-based researcher is really what it means to be a kind of creative manipulator of data and its ability to creatively manipulate data by lucidly evolving one's aesthetically attuned uh, remixological filters that I think we can begin disrupting and altering not only the humanities landscape, but perhaps the stuck in the mud position uh, of so much of the STEM fields that, uh, for example, the creative industries find themselves codependent on. So it ends up that, that for me, uh, DH has always stood for disrupting or disruptive humanities. And the digital part is just the latest evolutionary instance of what has always felt like a rival tradition in art and writing. One that can be traced back as far as you know you want to go. I'll I'll choose to go with, say, Lawrence Stern as a metafictionally attuned practice-based researcher disrupting the interface, but they're in this case, you know, the interface of the book or the literary interface, but there obviously are many more. Uh, so my, my basic theory when it comes to practice-based research in early 21st 
century, right, digitally networked culture is that back in the day, and this is based off my experience uh, in Colorado, back in the day, if you wanted to play with technology, and especially if you wanted to have access to the tools that would allow you to experiment with computational processes, most of the time you had to go into fields like engineering or computer science. But the, uh, the dramatic shifts that have taken place in consumer culture, right, from the introduction of the personal computer to accessing the fast speed internet to nomadically wandering the desert of the real by way of semi-smart mobile media technologies now at our disposal have really reset the operational and behavioral conditions that we find ourselves in. So having access to the necessary digital media technology, one needs to start experimenting in their own fictional undertakings, right? Their construction of online digital or flux personae by way of intuitive and aesthetic manipulation of the data, the data of everyday life, uh, has opened up humanities research to an area that practice-based researchers are quite familiar with, right? The field of making, right? image making, conceptual language making, filmmaking, performance making, even object making, theory making, database making, remix, code making, social media performance making, uh, my students today who outside of the institution are all about the using of digital media technologies to personally express themselves often find themselves kind of time traveling back into a world that resembles 1980s academia as if none of this other stuff has ever happened. Meanwhile, most if not all of the students in my seminar this semester started using the internet when they were four or five years old. And, and I don't take that term using very lightly. It's a term that floats around the underground drug culture as well and relates to the algebra of need, a phrase introduced to us by the beatnik uh, junkie writer, William Burroughs. In fact, in an interview for the 50th anniversary publication of Naked Lunch, Burroughs was asked about the algebra of need. And he responded by saying, by the algebra of need, I simply meant that Given certain known facts in an equation and the equation comprising a situation of absolute need, any form of need, you can predict the results. Leave a sick junkie in the back room of a drugstore and only one result is possible. The same is true of anyone in a state of absolute hunger, absolute fear. The more absolute the need, the more predictable the behavior. Now I'm not, of course, trying to compare all of our mobile phone toting, Facebook updating, Twittering students to heroin addicts. In fact, the speed with which many of us, uh, even transitional figures who started on the internet in our 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, have unconsciously embedded these emerging and now quite instrumental operational behaviors into our conceptual machinery, <clears throat> excuse me, signals an opening for the culture at large to reimagine what it means to become, uh, say, an innovative artist operating in the, uh, the rival tradition. Uh, in the case of the avant-garde, uh, it may be even referred to as an anti-tradition, a kind of uh, a living archive composed of what in Remix the book I call source material everywhere, and that repositions this hybridized practice-based researcher post-humanist as, as an applied remixologist who models different versions of how to do the humanities as an activist, say, hack, think process worth personally expressing yourself in. So as someone who's not only big on documenting their creative project development, but also theorizing, <clears throat> excuse me, and speculating on future forms of artistic practice, as well as their relationship to the university's growing interest in creative research and pedagogy. My goal has been, is, and always will be to advocate for a more advanced avant-garde arts research agenda as an essential part of the university. Uh, and we, in fact, are starting a new practice-based PhD program in intermedia 
art writing and performance at Colorado. Uh, and the main reason I advocate for this kind of thing is because I think it's becoming clear to all the stakeholders that practice-based artistic research methods involve creative work processes that provide a valuable alternative to the more ingrained scholarly practices and scientific practices. And there are perhaps, there are perhaps two predictable outcomes. For example, the scholarly monograph, or even in an academic arts context, the, you know, the fine arts gallery show. And now that so many of our students have access to the conceptual machinery required to operationalize their, their ongoing and unconsciously generated information behaviors, I wonder if even there's a choice in the matter. Uh, how else to stay aesthetically fit? Uh, I think I'll end it there. And uh, thank you very much. sort of redefining what innovation is today and new new models, new structures to be able to deal with what innovation is and how it happens differently, which I think is quite nice. There's a few things that have come up, which is uh, nice connections to make. Sorry, did you have a question? <laughs> I'll stop talking. Um, yeah, thanks a lot for, for both presentations. Um, very interesting connections and very interesting contrast between the two. Um, and I would like to maybe pick up on Mark's very final sentence, how to, how to stay fit aesthetically. I, I really like that question. Um, and let me kind of bring that back to the, to the first talk, because what, what struck me was um, um, the omnipresence of the word lab uh, and laboratories uh, in relation to all these experiments. And coming from science studies, for me, laboratories are or have been kind of conventionally conceived of as, well, not very creative places, because the whole idea is that they discover things that are supposed to exist anyway. Um, whereas, I guess, what, what you've been trying to articulate was, um, was exactly uh, new modes of, of, of creation. Uh, and so, basically, uh, this is just a comment and maybe also an invitation uh, uh, to Mark to, to think about, okay, what are, what, what are the others of labs when it comes to uh, creative process? How could we stay fit aesthetically that is not necessarily the aesthetics of, of laboratories? Yeah, sure. Um, good questions. So as part of this new practice-based PhD uh, program in intermediate art writing and performance, we're trying to find ways to bring artists and humanists together in what we are calling a studio collaboratory. And it's not really just artists and humanists. Those would be the primary players in, uh, in the studio collaboratory. But, uh, you know, we'd also invite others as well, media studies, scholars, uh, information scientists, et cetera. In fact, we're finding that uh, there's, there's a, a bit of stuck in the mudness in, uh, in the science labs right now in terms of like how to generate innovation and creativity. And they're turning more and more to the studio critique model as a way to try and uh, initiate some collaborative energy and bring people in from, from different areas. So uh, the lab itself, you know, we might call it a playground as well, or, you know, a sandbox. It's really more just like an open, uh, an open setting for researchers to collaborate with each other. Maybe it's even more like a meta lab. It's kind of like an umbrella for various research projects to take place in. Just add to that. I remember turning up at the Visual Perception Lab at Liverpool University years ago, being really disappointed that actually it was just a room with some things on the wall and didn't, uh, you know. And then actually went to see a visual, visual perception 
uh, a, no, a vision scientist in a different department, and uh, he showed me some much more sexy-looking equipment, so I kind of felt a bit more satisfied. But I think <laughs> the idea of um, a lab, certainly within uh, the arts, is kind of thought about as, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a concept, right? It's... it's um, it's used as a sort of, uh, like I was using the word kitchen for a long time. I, I kind of thought about bomb as an artist's kitchen where people would just meet and cook up ideas and um, ex experiment. It's just a kind of, it's a space for exchange. And um, yeah, for, uh, from what Mark was saying as well, actually the, the collaboration and knowledge exchange has come across in recent years as being more and more important. And I think this is one way that universities can play a really key role um, in broader cultural programs because they are filled with brilliant academics with great ideas that have far too much time to think that actually can be really inspiring and influential to, to artistic programs and, and uh, the way that artists develop their ideas and other people um, develop their ideas and they can be challenging in all sorts of ways. And So for me, the lab is this, it's the space. It's not even, you know, we don't even have a... The centre for disruptive media isn't even a real building. You know, it's not a centre. We're, we're <laughs> it, you know, it doesn't really exist. But um, you know, in, in the in in the same way that a kind of lab um, doesn't necessarily need to be a physical place with sexy equipment, I think. Yeah, I mean, it's if uh, I'm hear, my, hear myself talking to myself, so I have to stop for a second. Uh, it's it's also a kind of. Uh, you know, building on what Karen's talking about, it seems like a more fluid and hybridized uh, concept of what a lab can be. So it can exist online, it can exist in modular spaces. And also, uh, I must say, something that I've always been interested in, in my role here in Colorado, is locating ways to bring it out into the community. So we have alternative galleries and museums throughout the, uh, the Denver Boulder region who we partner with. And so what we might think of as the lab, which is basically where a lot of us meet and collaborate and research, uh, we then bring it out into the community. And that's in a way uh, just taking the lab to another space. So it, it's, it's really sort of hybridized in that way. You talk about glitch, which, which to me essentially means error, which sort of harks back to the old analog days. Um, do you look, do you, why don't you go back to analog or, or um, and mm. also how does remix radically differ from postmodernism? Yeah, uh, I was going to also mention when Karen had talked about going to that, uh, that other lab and finding all this, the sexy equipment there, one of the things that's kind of interesting from the perspective of, of I think, uh, folks who are identifying with disruptive digital humanities is that older equipment uh, is in some cases sexy as well. Uh, one of the, uh, the labs that we that we're collaborating with here in Colorado is called the Media Archaeology Lab. And there's lots of uh, old computers and equipment, uh, floppy disks, etc. around and we're using uh, those computers actually to investigate works of electronic literature and uh, early works of net art uh, in their kind of their native environments, right? The, the technology, the hardware, software that they were originally created on and using that as source material to, uh, to develop new work in. Regarding the, uh, the history of Remix, it goes, it goes way back, of course. Um, that's why I mentioned, in fact, uh, my own remix of La Tremonde's uh, the Songs of Maldoror as part of it was basically my second novel called Sexual Blood. The first one, The Kafka Chronicles, is is kind of an elaborate remix of uh, meta, Metamorphosis by Kafka as well. If you read La Tremonde's uh, The Songs of Maldoror, you'll you'll realize that he was very much a plagiarist. He said that plagiarism was necessary and that progress uh, depended on it. And so he was pulling from a lot of uh, the goth lit and other uh, scientific manuals, et cetera, of his time. I mentioned William Burroughs in my presentation and the algebra of need. Of course, Burroughs uh, with the painter Brian Geisen was responsible for having uh, started the literary cut up. You can look at the way that the Cubists 
for integrating uh, material elements into the paint, like chair caning or newspapers, et cetera, uh, all the way through, say, well, Situationist to Tournament, of course, was part of the history of remix as well. So uh, remix appropriation methods have a, have a long history. And so it's, I'm not trying to suggest that there's anything particularly new about the idea of remix. In fact, uh, if you look at the uh, the Open Humanities Press book that that I uh, created in conjunction with with Gary and the other editors, you'll see that I'm uh, suggesting that it's actually co-evolutionary. It's like it's part of part of who we are, and it, it, it goes all the way back to the beginning in a way. Like we're all born remixers is the way that I put it and remix the book. And uh, and there is there's also a uh, uh, a survey of other forms of remix and other ways of looking at, it, including like film collage at the remixthebook.com website. So I think it's really important to acknowledge that that history that it grows out of, and then just look at how it's being put into uh, practice today, with the you know with the data of everyday life or what I call the source material everywhere, sort of at our fingertips, and how easy it is to to manipulate that data and screw it up to use Flusser's term and then redistribute it throughout the network. Yeah, just also, I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of old media um, and actually uh, the last place that I worked after fact was a photography gallery and um, we went through a capital project and decided, the director decided not to have a dark room because there was this idea that actually all artists just work digitally nowadays. Um, but it's it's rubbish, actually. The number of artists that would say to me, or photographers, uh, you can have a dark room, and they really miss the social space, the communication and collaboration that was come through that physical space, but also the opportunity to experiment with old histories and old medias. And and um, it's it's also about kind of craft and, and skill and, you know, dying. You know, as technologies move on, then there becomes an interest in old technologies as well, and, that, and that's really... Um, a way of kind of recontextualizing and rehistoricizing and, and 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 lending sort of fresh light to what's going on now with different technologies and uh, so I think that's really important. But also just in relation to glitch, I think glitch is a really interesting area in terms of cyber security. It's the place where problems happen. So. Um, uh, yeah, one thing I've been keen to do here in the Centre for Disruptive Media is to try and uh, broker a partnership with the Ethical Hacking Lab at Coventry University, which sometimes gets me into trouble. Mm -hmm. um, we've got really different approaches to, to how we think about hacking. Um, and for me, the kind of tension between those um, two, two approaches is, is a really interesting space. Um, because, yeah, it's where, it's where the problems happen and, and actually where the really interesting things um, impact. Um, that, uh, that that's, that's ripe, ripe for exploration, I think. And, and this is why this uh, kind of curial activity is, I think, so important. Uh, Karen's mentioning the, the tensions with the other lab. Uh, you think of curation also as a practice-based research process and perhaps one of the primary ways of hacking or culturally critiquing you know, the very creative industries and security industries and spying industries that are kind of growing up all around us and that the arts and humanities now find themselves somewhat uh, codependent on. And so how do we, you know, how do we hack those, those systems? Hello. Um, I c I'm having some trouble formulating this question, really, but I'm not quite sure it might come out a bit vague, and I'm a bit wary of stepping on science studies kind of territory. But I'm just concerned about the kind of creative destruction of the humanities uh, and the kind of new model of knowledge production based on fluid, non-existent labor laboratories of interdisciplinary etc etc but like how far is that a, a part of the marketization of higher education and does that not worry anyone i mean we kind of talked about this in the original panel and then 
there's this uncomfortable synergy to use a, a university management term between the critical theory and the production of new modes of knowledge production and all this sort of stuff and you know where does the critique come into it you know the traditional role of humanities etc and it sounds kind of spectacularly productive these uh, to go back to this earlier term these laboratories of creative production and stuff you know I don't you know what I mean it's a kind of open vague question but it worries me a little bit well, I think worrying is is a good thing. Uh, I think Woody Allen's made a career out of it, actually. Uh, and those are the kinds of questions or worries that we would want to bring bring into lab. So it's not so much an embrace of innovation and you know the, the creative economies or industries. It's accepting the fact that that is part of the dialogue now in the ongoing corporatization of the university and then using it as source material again to hack into, I was talking I, in the uh, presentation and the performance I gave, I kind of uh, sampled from Ezra Pound talking about, and I, I think I mentioned in relation to glitch being possibly the uh, charging language to the utmost possible degree. He was referring to, to poetry, of course. But, uh, you know, so to be aware of Pound and to be aware of his writing, for example, and his theorizing as an artist, and then to sample from it and bring it into performance, and then to bring that into a hybridized fluid, yes, interdisciplinary or intermedia lab setting within a university that uh, invites artists and researchers from many different backgrounds to come in and address these questions and to address these worries and to anticipate where the questions are and the future worries are going to be is something that I think is quite necessary. It doesn't necessarily mean that everybody who identifies themselves as an academic artist or an artist or a humanity scholar has to actually do that or, be, you know, as just a mode of survival. These things can coexist, but I, they do need to coexist. It's not that one uh, is less relevant than the other and in fact they work together it's kind of what i'm getting at gary is the perfect person to to answer this one but gary is the perfect the person to answer uh, okay let me try and think uh, okay so we're very worried about critique um but if we, if, I mean, you know, Karen started off and she's talking about Marx and things, but if we'd have said, you know, it's the centre for the study of Marx or it's the centre for the study for dialectical, you know, Hegelianism or something, we'd have lasted about two minutes or they wouldn't have let us set it up or whatever, you know. It, and that partly one of the issues around critique, and it kind of goes back to what Sarah was saying, is about finding little spaces and niches. One of the things people would say theoretically about critique is it's kind of too... Uh, too oppositional, too obvious, you can kind of, you know, it, you're just standing yourself up there as a target and they're going to get you. Uh, so, and it's harder and harder to have spaces for critique in the university. So it's trying to find a space in, in the university where we'll get away with some of this stuff. Uh, so yeah, they're going to put pressure on us for targets and, and finances and things. And it's the same, you know, there's less funding for the arts and art centres. But can we come up with something that's kind of going to have that double role? So it does have a space for entrepreneurialism and the kind of creative and cultural entrepreneurialism that Karen specialising in, that Sarah was talking about in like scholars, entrepreneurs. For example, I was in a conference in Mexico and that was on uh, critical management studies. But they were saying because Mexico public funding is not really great and doesn't survive very well. So they have to kind of work as entrepreneurs to just do interesting, critical work. But their argument is, well, why does entrepreneurship have to be just associated with the right? And why let them have, you know, the conservatives let them have that space? Can we not do something interesting with it? So at least they're kind of trying. So we're doing that. At the same time, we're trying to engage with 
as Karen was saying, different forms of economies, different forms of operating things. It's trying to do both. The problem with it is, is yeah, it's it's not it's not simple. It's not without ambiguity. It's not without paradox or contradiction or any of those things. So, but you know, we're not going to find a space that isn't. Or it seems very hard. Hello. Um, hello, Mark. It's not Gary anymore. Uh, Sarah. Um, I found myself really uh, relating a lot to what you... I loved your manifesto and um, was really listening hard to what you were saying about writing because I was talking a bit about that myself. Coming from somewhere very connected and also very disconnected, I think, in relationship to you, um, particularly a kind of feminist history of debates on writing, going back from Haraway to Sisu, etc. Yeah, where uh, writing embodiment, writing situatedness, is a an issue. It's a burden. It's a strategy. Um, and then I was trying to connect the glitch, glitching and writing, together. Um, I wanted to hear a bit more about that. And if if um, if glitching is a kind of writing, I guess what I want to know is. Where's it happening? Where's it coming from? And what does it want? Um, I'm, I guess I'm referring to, to what you were suggesting about the connections between um, system cybernetics and fiction. Your, your canon of fiction, I, I, I recognise, but it's gendered. Um, um, so where does the glitching happen in relationship to system, in relationship to not so much author, uh, but authority? Yeah, great questions. Um, if you, I don't, you, you may not be familiar with my '97 work, uh, Grammatron. It, it was out there before Web 2.0, and uh, it starts off with the word "écriture," and then it goes to a creature, and then it moves into a writing machine, and so it's it's kind of a, a reading of. Uh, Sisu and Derrida's grammatology, but it's narrativized, I like to say metafictionalized, within what at the time was called hyper hypertextual space, soon to become net art, as they tagged it. And uh, so that's kind of where my connection to some of the French post-structuralist writers and uh, trying to find ways, yeah, for some sort of textual portage between the different texts and seeing ways to uh, remix them within a new media context started taking shape. Uh, it was soon thereafter, uh, say, the third part of my net art trilogy. So Grandma Chan was first phoneme or phone me or phony me, depending how you pronounce it, was second. And film text was third. And that was actually commissioned by the ICA and PlayStation 2 as part of the uh, How to Be an Internet Art retrospective that I had, I think it was in 2001, 2002. And soon thereafter, uh, I was invited to a few places to actually perform film text, which I thought was a net artwork. So performing, I wasn't quite sure what that, what that meant in terms of the invitation. And so uh, I didn't want to go and do it like a typical uh, demo, even though the film text work, which I can't show you right now, or I would, uh, is, is an interactive kind of like remix writing machine. But the, the difference, you might say, uh, between what I was doing with Grammatron and what I was doing with film text was that I was starting to integrate more video imagery. And so as a part of that invitation to, or as, as a result of that invitation to perform film text, both in uh, Switzerland and in Japan, I decided to get into what was then developing uh, as live audio visual performance, or what we were calling uh, VJing, right, video or visual jockey performance. And it was during that time of traveling and experiencing different levels of memory and, uh, and remix and accessing or capturing source material wherever I was and um, and remixing that into each per successive performance that I started getting into the idea of uh, developing the idea of image écriture, something like an image writing, but again, looking at it 
from a practice-based research perspective, uh, taking some of the ideas of, of writing, out, uh, writing out of the body, but using uh, the source material that I was engaging with and capturing as part of the tour, right? Every story is a travel story, a spatial practice. And so the more I did that, the more I saw the, the interaction with the technology, uh, with the network and with my laptop glitching images. And I found that quite interesting. And, and so then it became uh, an instrumental part of my, my developing artist theory of image écriture, which I develop in the, the first section of uh, metadata, which is a book I published in 2007. So that's how I kind of bring it all into the, you know, the writing live performance image, image mix. I'll take us back to the space concept. Um, uh, as a digital artist myself, I find uh, working more and more uh, into the cyberspace rather than the physical space, even though I'm almost graduating photography, which is happening in the physical space. Um, my main concern is that by working more and more in the cyberspace, I tend to relate or be members of communities that live there and, of course, living in the physical space that uh, creates a gap, let's say, within me, which I'm trying to fill. And both of you talked about spaces that you are creating or will create. and. I'm wondering how can these spaces answer questions as this one? Because it, it is inherent to the digital apparatus to live in the cyberspace. How can we, um, how can we bring that to the physical space? And I uh, don't know if you're familiar with, uh, well, there are many artists working in that way that bring uh, objects from the one world to the other or the, the new aesthetics uh, blog from James Briddle. Yeah, that is my personal concern, to be honest. Well, first of all, it's great that you, you're digitally connected at university, because when you leave, you're not going to have anyone around you, unless you do link up with a space like BOM. So that's brilliant. At least you've kind of tapped into some kind of... Um, virtual network that hopefully will you know continue for you after uni and that's really important I think bomb is certainly trying to to bridge the gap and to do things over for example Google hangout and um, discussions and things like that that will exist virtually and connect up people that it can't physically um, which will also be published open access and all that kind of stuff everything that we do that we can we'll share um, but yeah, I mean, we, we believe, I guess, when I came to the university, actually, I was kind of more interested in the physical relationship and, and what's kind of happened as a result of more interaction through, you know, digitally and virtually and, uh, and how that Im affects the kind of people that we are and our relationships and all that sort of thing. Um, and maybe through the kind of research of just talking to loads of people, loads of artists and peers and whatever, um, it, what emerged is that it's really important for people to have a physical space and, and that actually that is um, that is really missing today. The physical spaces are really kind of missing today as well. So hope, hopefully we can try and, you know, do do a bit of both. But I don't know, Mark, what, what do you what, what do you think, Mark? Well, we're, um, as I was suggesting, we're actually hybridizing it so that uh, we were very interested in bringing it out in the community. Unfortunately, when you live in a uh, in a kind of upper middle class community like like Boulder, you, you don't have access to these spaces like Bomb. Uh, this is one of the, the reasons why I spend so much time in the in the UK and other parts of the world because it's very difficult to uh, uh, start and sustain these kinds of uh, spaces in in most parts of the US. So what we do is we have to sort of actively uh, collaborate and uh, you know, partner, let's say, with spaces that already exist that are uh, being developed by uh, oftentimes socially conscious and uh, aesthetically aware 
uh, entrepreneurs who are starting, say, alternative presses, but are turning their, uh, their shop into a gallery, which then becomes a performance space. And so through, through uh, performances and, and exhibitions and partnering with events that take place off the campus, but then also partnering with alternative, uh, say, digital or electronic sound festivals that take place within the region and having them come into our seminar space or into our black box space and bring folks uh, from the community who are engaged with yeah, the emerging you know social media network environment and bringing them into our you know into our spaces on campus and then uh, turning them on to the kinds of research that we're doing, which sometimes is actually quite simpatico. Uh, I think you you really it, it takes a lot of work to do that, of course, because it, uh, it takes you it takes you away from your research because you're and you know and you're actual you know developing and say loosely finishing your outcomes so that they can. You know they can get out there, but uh, it, it's definitely worth it because what you're doing is you're you're building this community that exists uh, both you know in person and and online. So it's uh, it's kind of worth it actually. I think we need to stop there. So I'd like to thank all our fantastic speakers of today, and hope we can give them a big final applause. Too.